Lift off and the clock has started. Welcome to the Space Booker bustling hub and home for all out there entertainment with me, Dan Hadley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks. And I'll be right here for the next hour or so on this uh, regular show where we're opening up various realms, franchises and curiosities of our favourite genre and sub-genres for conversations and plain, unapologetic geek outs with friends and fellow fans. Some will be old and some will be new. <laughs> That's the, the shows and the films, not necessarily the guests. <laughs> but uh, yes, we're going to attempt to classify, you see, whether each of these is worthy of being added to your rolling list of essentials that, you know, if you have never got around to watching them, should you, should you make the time for each of these entries into the space book listed. And this time, it's uh, time to connect with your inner eight-year-old looking back at a movie that was uh, extraterrestrially popular in its day at the time of release. And I think it can get somewhat forgotten sometimes in the 21st century because bigger, better things have maybe come along since, certainly louder things and, and merchandise and marketing and promotion and all those sorts of things really exploded. But I think this was a key film in the road to wherever we are now, to the age of the MCU if you like. Yes, so we're extending a finger to point back at E.T., the extraterrestrial. Early work now of the legend legendary and prolific director Steven Spielberg. And it was just a year after he stormed cinemas with a landmark family adventure movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Spielberg was back with a project that couldn't be more different, but went on to hit bigger still, I think, arguably. Yes, it's the, uh, it became the, the biggest grossing movie of all time, nominated for nine Academy Awards. I had to just check that, including for Best Picture and Best Director. It won four, and I'm sure that one of our guests will be in with even more stats, if that's your kind of thing. Yes, guests. They are among us calling in from home, strangely enough. <laughs> Firstly, yes, it's uh, it's actor, filmmaker and podcaster over on his channel, Home Media Minefield, where he will uh, give you the heads up on various special editions of all sorts of titles, whether they are truly special or not. Welcome aboard, Keith Isles. Hey, how you doing? Hey, <clears throat> hey, the man in red. Uh, I'm wearing my Elliot E.T. hoodie. Yes, there you go. Um, in <laughs> honour in honor of today so uh yeah <laughs> very, very nice i feel i should have made more effort now i've just got my friend over my over my shoulder here my childhood buddy back <laughs> keeping an eye on me yes and, and so have you so what's that over on there what, what's that like? well this is actually a um uh, a limited edition uh 4k uhd release of the film with a blu-ray and a dvd as well and it's packaged uh in a um what they call a big sleeve edition, um, which was something they did a few years back to try and compete with the popularity of streaming. So they started uh, doing sort of unique packaging. Um, some some of the distributors did them looking like uh, VHS tapes, and oh, uh, yeah, 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 they, they, these have done them looking like 
laser disc if anyone remembers what what that is um so yes uh if you check out my channel i do do an unboxing on on, on this particular Can't product wait to making. see that big sleeve <laughs> your new you, you uh learn something new every day don't you there you go you big do. sleeve sounds like it sounds like a kitchen i like that big sleeve yes so who else have we got how could we go forward in this without him it's our uh, mega writer and mega director and he's never off duty when he's peering into movie history is he with that director's eye it can only be friend of the channel ian david diaz the mega geek hello <laughs> hello you look like a fly on that et shirt yay there you go i wonder what the hand signals were then he comes in looks like a fly it's, that's it's this, isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> a uh, very snazzy t-shirt you're wearing there, yeah. young man. Of course it is. <laughs> it's brand new for the occasion. It is indeed. Um yeah. I, I thought I'd get it, you know, because we I knew we were gonna do this. Uh, so so there you go. But this is not my idea. As no, you, no, it's know. all the fault of this person. So you can blame her. <laughs> we like to bring our wild cards. We like to bring our wild cards to these sorts of shows. And right now, I think she's probably wondering what the hell she's let herself in for. Joining us for the first time here on the Facebook channel, it's model and actress Izzy Allen. Welcome aboard, Izzy. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, no. Still here, didn't do a runner in the green room in the meantime. Yes, welcome to the channel. With Thank you, you've got your hoodie on as well, but you haven't gone authentic 1982, have you? I haven't. No, I'm just wearing a Chicago Bulls hoodie. Nothing ET themed, I'm let afraid. Let the side down. Let I know, I know. <laughs> talking about sides, obviously there's people out there who are only hearing this in podcast form, but it's out there in video form as well on the channel. And it looks like we're sort of a... A, a doubles in tennis or something at the moment, isn't it? We're with a black team, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Red team here, the show offs and the swans who dressed up for the occasion. Yes, yeah, exactly. Oh, oh. Uh, yes, so ET, where did it come from? Ian, this wasn't the this wasn't the kind of movie that they were expecting Steven Spielberg to make back in no. the was it? No, um, the story goes that he was on the set of Raiders. And he was feeling a bit depressed. I don't know why. Maybe it was, I don't know, maybe Charlton. He went into the desert and he was turning over stones. And he thought this idea about um, aliens attacking a family. That was the first idea. Correct me if I'm wrong, Keith. Um, and he uh, he spoke to a lot of people about it. And um, I think it was Melissa, Melissa Matheson. And then he decided to do something else and then he decided to cram all the aliens into one alien. And it became E.T. And then he got lift some mass. He wanted her to write it, but she didn't want to do it. And it took him and Kathleen Kennedy and Harrison Ford, who was married to her at the time, to convince her to write it. Um, and it, yeah. And then the rest is history, I guess. There you go. So. <laughs> He does look somewhat alarmed there, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a thorn between two. How does that saying go again? <laughs> road, a road between two thorns. <laughs> waiting, waiting for inspiration to strike there, Steven Spielberg. Yeah. He yeah. was, at that point, it, I suppose it was Jaws, was the big breakout, then, then Close Encounters, Raiders. Yeah. So things had cranked up and up and up and up. I was I was just a, a schoolboy. I never heard of Steven Spielberg. I'd never joined those dots, Keith, back then. But were you? How aware were you of the trajectory of this man's work back in back in the day? Well, well, I was actually very aware because um, I was I was the same age as Elliot uh, when when he came out. So, um, and I had been funny enough. The thing that made me want to become a filmmaker was actually the previous Berg film, Raiders of the Lost Art, which um, Ian's already mentioned. And the the reason for that was he, we had on television a making uh, of program that I videotaped, again, old, old school videotape. And I watched it over and over again as a child. And I was fascinated by this. You know, I, it was the first time I understood what a director did and 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 when it came to et even though i was still a kid I, I was very aware of steven spielberg and um i'd been a little bit too young to see close encounters so i, I never saw that in data um so this was kind of my introduction into spielberg with aliens as it were um uh and and obviously 
got to see you know close encounters <laughs> shortly after and did actually think to myself my god there's there's a lot of similarities here and Correct. part of that to elaborate slightly on the story ian was was saying um he did indeed you know go for the walk in the desert and talk to melissa melissa Math, all that sort of stuff but um what he what he wanted to do is he was going to do a film about divorce because his his family it, yeah. had been through one but also yeah. he had a seed when he made uh close encounters he thought to himself what happen if one of those aliens got left behind so he said he can sort of combine those two ideas <laughs> and with the the genesis of et and then you know commissioned um melissa matheson to, to go and write a script based on his on conversations that they had um during raiders of the it's last a fascinating Star. fascinating and involved ge genesis isn't it isn't it to such a to such a really quite simple and charming film you know it's it's uh, it's got that it hits that sweet spot doesn't it in a sense it couldn't be simpler and yet underneath the surface as you say there's Ooh. all that texture or everything that stretches back into spielberg's own life you could say it's part autobiographical i don't know i don't know how he views it but i remember those shows they used to put on the tv mm -hmm. those 25 minute uh, documentaries they would take you behind the scenes of these films when they you'd see the directors making yep. it's usually on itv and yes they for, you'd think they'd spoil the magic somehow but they didn't did they they made you want to see it even more and and whilst i was never sure what all those guys sitting around <laughs> the various outskirts of the set from the people that i recognized like harrison ford whoever i was never sure what they were doing but I can imagine a couple of years on joining those dots and, and when you do know, oh, that's the director, they do this, they do that, why that would sort of springboard you into thinking, I wouldn't mind being the one sat in that chair. But talking about talking about TV, I was going to ask you, Izzy, because you weren't around in 1982, were you? No, right. I was not. <laughs> <laughs> when, did it, when, do you remember when you first saw E.T. and where it was? Was it on TV or on video or something? It was on video. I was visiting my grandparents in Sweden and my mum had brought a little videotape to keep us kids occupied. And I remember sitting there and watching it for the first time and yeah. just thinking it was just the most lovely, charming movie. And I actually hadn't seen it. I watched it quite a few times when I was younger. I actually hadn't seen it for such a long time. And then I refreshed my memory um, earlier in the week. And I just thought it's just it it's it's an old movie, but it just doesn't date. It's still just as charming and um, lovely to watch even now. Did you cry? I, I got a bit teary eyed. Yeah, I did <laughs> cry, but it is. Yeah, I, you know what? I cry every mean? time. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Usually, um, I am such is, a crier, but you see, I've, I've got a question though. Presumably, the version you saw did did you see the twentieth anniversary version then? because um it was re-released in yeah. 2002 we'll come, we'll come for the 20th that. anniversary we'll come yeah that later on okay. yeah we'll, we'll, dig up, we'll dig up a little bit of that but yeah what i was interested in is what you're saying there about it being even though it's an old film that it hasn't dated you see to to guys like us who are around at the time various ages oh. It goes Retro. through a it, it goes through this sort of passage where it looks incredibly yeah. dated because yeah. you know we use we remember using telephones and things like that just like the ones in the film, mm. but I think there's I think that items that movies and TV shows they eventually they they reach a point in the good ones where they sort of push through that and they do become timeless and I watched it this week too as well ET for the first time in a very long time, and I was struck by that too it it does have this timeless magic and this fairy tale quality i think uh, particularly when you look at images like this yeah i think spielberg was saying that he's making a disney film but not for mm. disney i remember him saying that um while he was making it so because a backyard yeah. is a backyard isn't it a backyard back in 1982 is the same as a backyard now it would have been not the same really backyard <laughs> in the 1950s. I'd, I'd say i'd say they broadly speaking are i mean you might have a few better gadgets the lawnmower might look might look a bit nicer <laughs> but generally speaking there's you know there's a pile of dog poo in one corner and <laughs> you've been meaning to take to the tip in the other but you know there's maybe a discarded pizza box or whatever but i'm interested in what you were just saying there is about your was it your grandmother who who gave it to you who, who oh, i was at my grandparents house but yeah. i think my mum must have 
stuck it on just to get us to be quiet and sit down for five minutes and just watch a movie. <laughs> was, it, so. was it one of those where where when they give it to you? Because I've I've done this as well. I've been on the I've been the recipient and I've done this with my own children, where you give them these things and then you wait and you watch. Were, were, were they watching you to see what your response would be, do you think? <laughs> to no be completely would. honest, I just can't remember now. I just remember yeah. being like captivated by this movie, but um, yeah, I can't remember if my mum they was watching. Have, they must have must have known it would have been right up your street, I think. I think I, a lot of people, I, um, yeah. sorry, a lot of people forget that E.T. is famous for something else as well. It's, it's famous for um, piracy. And E.T., yes. the first time I saw E.T. was on a VHS pirate um, version of the mm. film. And then uh, a week later, I saw it in the cinema and it was a completely different experience for me. I remember... I was at school at the time. I was in um, the fifth form and we had a video club because VHS just came out at that time. And I don't know if you remember the Ferguson TriStar uh, VHSs with the very well, yeah, the, with the, the the top loader. Do you remember that, Keith? The top loader you come out? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The first ones, yeah, were yeah and then yeah, they yeah. went into the front loader. Yeah. Lenser. And then yeah, I yeah. Had a fr <laughs> my dad had a friend, a, a guy named Ray, who used to come around our house every Saturday with a with a suitcase full of films <laughs> and one of them was et and he didn't realize what he was giving us so i we watched et and we thought this was this is great and then i went back to my school and i said i've got et can i show it to 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 the students and at that time piracy wasn't so big it was you know and and films i think films didn't have certificates i'm not really sure about that either but was, um i think it was something like yeah once they realized it was et the teachers were all over it they were like can you make me a oh. copy stuff like that and i'm like <laughs> well why <laughs> it's only a film and, and you know we didn't realize how how big the film was going to be at the time you, so, you said it was a different fun. experience so you went back you went to the cinema to see yes. very soon afterwards because i'm i would even at that moment in time i'm a lot older than everybody here i was a huge fan of spielberg from close encounters to raiders lost ark and i knew this was a spielberg film so you would have seen it anyway I, yeah so i i couldn't resist watching it on vhs which was the copy when you look at it now copy is probably shit but um <laughs> i had to see it in the cinema and when i watch in the cinema it's a completely different experience to watching it on vhs you know it totally blew me away the whole film so there you go how about you keith do you remember do you remember finally get to seeing it was it one of those that you came to the weeks down to no I, I yeah i mean i i was lucky enough the first time i saw it was in the cinema on the big screen i remember my mum took me um <laughs> and she, she had a little week she had a little weep during it as well for sure Ooh. uh bless her and um yeah but but I, I ian's absolutely right i do remember that um shortly after uh there was this whole thing uh at school and whatever circulating where there were indeed pirated um videotapes of of this yeah. going around and that i mean it was literally somebody had sat in a cinema and videoed it from, from from their seat i mean the 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 quality of it was absolutely <laughs> appalling um and, yeah, and you know it, it was just dreadful you know so um uh but but definitely seeing it on that big screen um you, you know I, just yeah at young age just it was difficult so I'm, I'm so i'm so grateful for that experience actually yeah it's so much so much <laughs> I think people people forget, you know, even people like like us who are around at the time, and it, this is going to seem like completely alien to some people out there watching. Maybe you too, Izzy, because back then in the early eighties, we had to wait months. You yeah, would, yes. we had to wait months to see these films. So yeah. this, believe it or not, this came out in the in June of nineteen eighty two in America. So it's a big summer blockbuster that took took the nation by storm, yeah. and it literally exploded in a in a major major pop culture way. And over here, we sort of felt the waves of it. So we'd get those programs on the TV, just like you were describing, Keith, and clip shows and chat shows and things like that. And kids shows would start talking about it. There was a, ga a kids game show called Screen Ooh. Test that I remember showing a few clips yeah. of it. Oh, things yeah. like that. Yeah. And yeah. it was, so it came out in June in, in America. And believe it or not, Izzy, it didn't come out until the 9th of December in the UK. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So yeah. all That's that right. time, can you imagine now, six months the spoilers wouldn't even be a thing. You'd know every single beat of that film, and you would almost certainly, be, you know, you get crystal clear DVD copies coming over by now. Wouldn't you? If it was, the, if it was the same thing now. Well, I mean, yeah. I'm interested to, to know what version you saw actually, because there was the version where Spielberg had corrected it, where he took the guns out of the people's hands and stuff, and you know, they keep he... jumping the gun. They keep yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the guns. 
What version did <laughs> right. you see? That's, that's the question, is he? I did I didn't even know that there was uh, that there were two versions yeah. of it. What was this? He took the guns well, out of what... um I think it was it Gini eighties Keith where they corrected it. I can't remember. No, no, no. They corrected uh, it for the twentieth anniversary in two thousand and two. But I can see right. Dan's getting annoyed, so I'll I'll shut up. And <laughs> there, Dan. Sorry. Right. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, in like, in two thousand and two. <laughs> yes, look, we're coming to that a little later on. Okay. But yes, they did. What what it was? I mean, yes, it was it was uh, after the big drive, after George Lucas went back to the Star Wars movies and tinkered with those. Spielberg, for a time, thought it was okay to go back and tinker with that. And for a while, I think, he, that version, the tinkered version of E.T., was the only one that you could get your hands on for a little while. I'm, I'm not really sure why he decided what there. No, but I was going to say, I remember back then, back in 82, there was this big gap between the, the American release and the release over here. There was a, a couple of people when I was at primary school, they were fortunate enough to go on holiday to America. And th this was back then in the eighties, this was an impossibly glamorous. It yeah. was a big deal, is it? Yeah. It was impossibly glamorous that somebody had been to America and two of my classmates, they went over at the same time over the summer. When they come back in September, one of them was wearing a, a sweatshirt, like a just a normal everyday sweatshirt, but it got the ET logo on it in sort of in that, sort of purpley color but pinned yeah. to it they also got pinned to the same sweater was this badge <laughs> yeah. i i have hunted high and low for one of these because it stayed with it i i'd heard of et because i'd seen just a couple of little clips here and there on those shows but most of the kids in my class had no idea what this was and this girl her name was joanne matthews and she's on my facebook <laughs> On my Facebook friend list now. So if you're out there, Joanne, and you remember wearing this, so I remember you wearing it too. But yeah, people were asking her, you know, like, what's that? What's the badge? What's the sweater? And you know, she she was feeling pretty special because she'd be just been to America, coming yeah. back, telling us about all these things. You know, everybody's oh, tell us more, tell us about the cars, tell us about the movies, tell you know, tell us about the food, even. And that yeah, you know, so that's one of my earliest examples of ET. And of course, I just felt I, I was so knocked. I wasn't that jealous about the fact that she'd been to America, but I was jealous. <laughs> she saw ET. That she'd seen ET. <laughs> seen ET. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The general story, let's recap the story a little bit, because the story of ET is that it's a, a simple tale. I think that's part of the joy of it. It follows a 10-year-old boy called Elliot living with his mother and siblings following his parents' separation. He befriends a lone, stranded alien in his backyard one dark evening whilst whilst they're all having a pizza night the et forms an emotional and otherworldly bond with the child as they learn to communicate and explore suburban life i suppose through through the aliens eyes it's all it, it is the simplest of stories, isn't it? And uh, it has a fairy tale edge to it. I think it's only when you backtrack and sort of boil it down to two or three sentences that mm. you you truly appreciate that. But yeah, I was reading upon this as well. I hadn't realised quite what Spielberg had gone through as a as a child and how yeah. he channel how he channeled it here here. Ian, he yeah. was obviously so he was in his thirties at this point, successful at what he was doing. Lucky bastard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal success with Close Encounters. But yeah, I mean, yeah. that's what I'd read too, that it had been the, uh, they were, uh, I think it was Columbia. Yeah, so it's Columbia that Close Encounters was with, wasn't it? So Columbia mm -hmm. were desperate to get a sequel out of him to Close Encounters. And he was struggling to find that story. Settled on something called Night Skies, which, as you <laughs> rightly said earlier on, it was more a sort of a horror thing, really. It was about yes. a farmer and his family being terrorised by aliens. Aliens were dismembering the cattle and all sorts of things. So it was a lot, lot darker. And, uh, yeah, he, he just reached a point where he didn't want to be in that place. He wanted something that would sort of be a bit, be more magical and that could nourish him on a more sort of spiritual level almost. And so, yeah, so he went off and left a lot of the people who were working on Night Skies stayed at Columbia to sort of continue working on that. And it's metamorphosized into poltergeist. It's a poltergeist of all things, yeah, yeah. apparently. Uh, and yeah. the rest of them went over to Universal with Spielberg to, to make what he'd originally written, he titled as E.T. and Me. That was the, the yep. draft title of this story. But the, the alien in this 
little e you can't call him anything but et can you and you, you shouldn't even call him a him apparently i was reading recently that steven spielberg said he's oh, neither no. a he he's not neither a he he's best. never he's Probably. neither a he nor a gender she. neutral Genuinely that's supposed rubbish. To be. Non -binary. Is that in the eighties? That's all <laughs> crap. They just they just shoved that stuff in now in any in anything or everything now. It's ridiculous. So, apparently, e -T, e -T, e -T, end of story. Apparently, is the E.T. is supposed to be a plant-like life form? Does that ring true to you? Plant-like. Yeah, pl yeah, he's like a plant life mixed with mixed with uh, <sighs> biological life. And that's why he's got this link to plants and to nature and all the rest of it. That's what Spielberg says now. Yeah, that's 40 true. Years on. Although, to be fair, there is the line in it when Gertie asks, is it a boy or a girl? And Elliot says, it's a boy. That's you right. Know, when oh, he really? made, <laughs> they introduced him. When they introduced went, uh, E.T. to, the, to M Michael and Gertie, there is Maybe that line. Maybe he was a boy in Elliot's eyes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But what about, like, like, hashtag misgendered. <laughs> what, what about when they, 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 were, they were playing um, Dungeons and Dragons, which is that really dates the film, doesn't it? Dungeon, I don't know if you guys ever played Dungeons and Dragons. I don't even know what that is if I'm I know, see, if you don't, if you don't know what <laughs> that is. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons. Um, a lot of people yeah. really like it. I played it for a time. I couldn't yes, never I get into it. I found it way too involved. Yeah. I was a little impatient for it, I think. But multiple, multiple boards and, and dice of different shapes yeah. and sizes. But it's the kind of game that's best played by torchlight i suppose isn't it? but also it's imagination as well i mean today yeah. they're all like this or they're like that on a screen and stuff or on their phones playing something whatever but in those days we had to use our imagination to, to for our entertainment put it that way so uh yeah, very different very different world <laughs> No, I'm, I'm laughing because Izzy's probably sat there going, all right, boomer. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> so, suburban life, as depicted in this, from the games that they play and the food that they eat, like we, we see the pizza box, you know, pizza boxes haven't changed in all that time, have they? It's still exactly the same, really. No, I just want to point out one thing, right? The re one of the reasons why mm. I like tea so much is because when I was a kid, kind of teenager, whatever, when I was a lot younger and I used to watch Disney films, they always made films, especially with kids in suburban areas, you know, where there was hills and trees and little quaint houses and stuff like that. And I, 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 was, I was born in London and I lived in South London most of my life. And I grew up in a council estate. So when I was a kid, I always dreamt about living in a, a real house, do you know what I mean? And and yeah, look, looking at things like that and seeing the stars in the sky, but I never ever experienced that. And I think that kind of, you know, that kind of thing with E.T. kind of attracted me as a kid, you know, because it's kind of one of my wishes to to live in that kind of area and stuff like that as a kid, of course. Now, I think, I think it's, <laughs> I think it was, it was a, great, a great job of framing what many would view as the mundane in, mm. in a very uh, dreamlike way. Yeah. One of the things that I remember from when I first saw it as a seven, eight-year-old boy was the opening sequence where E.T. and all his various little plant-like mates of, of various genders or not, when they're all scuttling around and, what, and one of them gets left behind. As a child, I could never work out what was going on there. I always thought it was a little bit murky. And I think that's, I think that's the fault of the director. On the director's part, and I was watching it on the big screen, but it might have been too, it might have been too big for my eyes then. But uh, yeah, we're looking at the moment on screen of of the scene, obviously, because when when the ET does get left behind, and he, he sees the uh, the spacecraft disappearing, and he, it's all alone, and not a word is is spoken, nothing audible to human ears. I, I, we do, I we do I fixate on this view, don't we? And what yeah. it does do that's something that is so everyday to us, but for for somebody for somebody coming from the outside looking in it captures i think right. what must be quite uh, intimidating even you know even the great technology that uh, that a, a being would have to come from another world to ours that would still be intimidating wouldn't it yeah um another thing i don't know if you realize this izzy when you're watching the film but um mm. another conscious thing that spielberg did was he made sure halfway through the film that you never saw any adults apart from the mother so every adult you see um, in the first half of the movie, you only see them from the hip. From oh, really? Right. I didn't notice yeah. that. So remember, uh, do you remember the scene where the where Elliot goes missing and then the police is interviewing the mother? Yeah. And they, oh, yeah. You, don't you see didn't the see. 
Oh, yeah. yeah you don't see the teachers either with the frog scene. You don't see the teachers either and stuff. And also, I think Spielberg, there was a conscious decision not to see E.T. until it was right, because that's why he was always in silhouette in the beginning to create that mysterious thing. And also, the scientists that were running after E.T., you never saw their faces. It's always just shot from here. So why uh, was that for the, the keys. not showing the adults? I think Keith will explain that one. <laughs> Go on, Keith. Yeah, no, I mean, he... he... Well, in terms of the the setting, um, Spielberg always sort of described it as a Norman Rockwell suburbia. So even even though it was suburbia, it was slightly, slightly heightened, slightly you, you know, um, uh, fan you know, a sort of perfect suburbia yeah, rather than it, a messy it, idyllic suburbia. Fences. Yeah, it's exactly. Norman Rockwell was a, an, an illustrator, wasn't he? Illustrator in the mid midpoint of the twentieth century, yeah. worked in yeah. advertising. Some of the most iconic paintings in that in advertising and and media that we've have ever like that been 50s seen in America. The, yeah, that, like, sort of, that. Yeah, yeah. That and but, like, but, I, he's, I, but he 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 always said though that to answer what Ian was asking, he always said that he wanted to. Um, you know, he wanted to have that sort of Norman Rockwell suburbia, but at the same time, he wanted this story to absolutely be about the kids and not adult. So, and he even considers Mary, played by Dee Wallace, who's who's the mum, he considers her kind of a child as well in this film. Um, so every other adult, be it a, a school teacher, a policeman, um, you, you know, or, or, or the scientists, he'd always sort of film from behind or in silhouette or from the waist down with the keys and stuff like that jingling yeah. because he wanted it to just, he wanted every the drama to just be about the kids. And I think, again, that's one of the things that makes this so possible yeah. and so universal is the fact that mm. we've all been kids or we were kids when we were watching it. So you, you, you can totally relate to it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now, I had noticed that and I did wonder why. I th I thought it was something almost Wizard of Oz-like, where, whereas it, whether it was supposed to be making another another statement entirely about, uh, about uh, a boundary between adulthood and childhood. Uh, acceptance, acceptance of wonder and yeah. of, of possibility and, and not having so much received prejudice uh, and on a simple fairy tale level as well, just just being a lot less sympathetic. I think with children, when they look at adults, particularly adults that they don't know, they look, you know, they, they make eye, con onto eye contact with you and look for that familiar flicker. And if they can't see that, if the face is sort of in shadow, if they're wearing a hat like the, a police sheriff or, or a space helmet like the guy from NASA that we see later on, I think it, it's that barrier between them so I, I think it's all all fascinating and it, and the only time that they break that is halfway through the film yeah, isn't it where, to, yeah. where the, yeah the emergency in emergency room sort of scenario and i noticed that as they were doing that and and various adults we see one by one more adult faces in that scene it's almost as if that's when they connect and invest in et they are completely sympathetic and empathic towards that character in the same way that, that Elliot is and the other children are at that point. And then as the film goes on and, and it, it sort of becomes more adrenalized again and he becomes a hunted animal again, it regresses back so you see less adult faces again. It's, it's as if that's a sort of an intermission somehow. I'm probably looking at this slightly too deeply. I think, he, I think Spielberg wanted it to be at the level of kids. So mm -hmm. that, that's the reason why. And also he was talking about Tom and Jerry as well. I remember he, there was an interview with him and he was saying, you know, when you look at the cartoons, they never show adults, like even the big black <laughs> and Tom and Jerry, you always yeah, saw her legs. Yeah. yeah, you always saw her legs. You never saw her face. And he said that that was the kind of thing that he was trying to, he was trying to say, this is all of a level of kids until the adults get involved. And then the kids kind of slightly grow up they become kind of adult slightly as well when 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 the second half of the movie starts when et's obviously dying and all that stuff so so yeah that's i mean the thing is that the film is very very clever from from using silhouettes to not showing adults to um to the actual um et itself and and also spielberg shot it in chronological order because he realized okay. that the kids the kids needed to you know go through the whole journey and have that that emotional 
thing right at the ending when when mm. et is leaving and stuff like that so that's why shut it in chronological order so um so yeah, there's a lot of thought went went into this film i do believe that this is the first film spielberg did without a storyboard um so is that true i don't know is it true, Keith? Yeah, you know, more than <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apparently, um, really. One, one of the yeah. things he did. One of the things he did on this as well was he said that um, uh, Melissa used to print off just the scenes they were shooting that day yeah. on index on cards, cards yeah. that he could just in his shirt pocket, so that when he was, I mean, I mean, on on the, yeah. on the media release, there's some wonderful behind the scenes stuff where you see Spielberg working with the kids yeah. and. Um, yeah, it's 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 quite it's quite um, inspiring to watch. Actually. So as you, were, as you were describing a moment ago, there, Ian, he was mm. taking the children through it step by step by step. He yep. was also working through it step by step by step. No, he, he did it for the kids because mm. um, he realised that the kids needed to go on an emotional journey. So when they came to say say because they were so used to seeing ET on set, you know, even though it was a it was a puppet. They were so used to seeing him. And even the girl who played Gertie, I can't remember her name now. What's her name? Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore. Yeah. She used to talk to it, you know, <laughs> when they're not, she used to believe it was real. So when they had to say goodbye to it, she was very emotional. So, and Aww. also when it died as well. So she's, so that's why he did it. Very clever director. The, very, the, very clever thing that he did. The last scene was literally the last time that any of yeah. those were yeah. going to uh, act with that animatronic ever. Mm. So yeah. and he told them that he said, "Today we switch ET off at the end of this, and that's what it." What a nasty man! No, I, mean, <laughs> I, I mean, it was to get the emotion out of them, right? So, and it works beautifully. I mean, that end scene well, you know, is heartbreaking. I, I, you know? ET is my one of my favourite films of all time, right? And um, there's the scene in it that's just pure genius. Is the frog scene? The frog <laughs> scene doesn't have any sound. If you notice, yes. halfway through when he's releasing the, the frogs. And all the frogs are, are going. He shoots the frogs, and he obviously you don't see the adults. And it's all played with music um, uh, when Et is watching TV, and then he kisses the girl and all that. I thought that was genius, a genius piece of filmmaking, and you know, really imagine that confused the hell out of me when I was a child. I don't, I don't mind admitting. <laughs> <laughs> admitting that one and yes. the little girl was in baywatch wasn't she? baywatch yeah uh, Ellen, Ellen, Ellen. 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 yeah so when, was... when elliot stands what does he stand does he stand on one child to kiss apparently that was erica ellen ellen yeah, yeah from baywatch she was my, my brother told me about that i never watched baywatch believe it or not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yes they're, they're all in this we'll talk about <laughs> yeah. so let's let's talk about the cast for a little while then because uh, yeah. yes here, here they all are oh. and uh elliot uh, aren't they cute Bless so them. cute now yeah. elliot was uh, henry thomas jr uh, mm. it's uh, a peculiar i think performance it's a little otherworldly in itself i've always thought right. everybody there's oh, something brilliant He's got a, a very sort of um, angelic face, but some of the expressions that he pulls sometimes and the way that he talks, it's a little bit awkward, awkward enough to be really, really interesting to watch. And uh, it says here, I've been and looked them all up, and Thomas, as, as one would expect, as is commonplace with child actors, did struggle to eclipse this part yeah. for a long, long time. But he's continued to have a, a steady string of roles on film and TV. And uh, last year he was in Doctor Sleep, the the, yes, uh, well. the sequel to The Shining with uh, Hugh McGregor. Uh, but at the moment he's in DC's Stargirl, the TV show, yeah, and the Netflix series the, ha the Haunting of Hill House, which I, I haven't seen. Apparently its sequels just dropped as well. Apparently he's in those two. So he's sort of come back really in, in middle age. And uh, you were mentioned Dee Wallace earlier on who played the mother. She was known as a, a scream queen at the time. She'd been in things like The Howling and The Hills Have Eyes. And uh, it yeah, she's a fantastic actress. She's still around now, still acting in film and, and TV into her 70s. But uh, Michael Norton there on the right plays the, the older brother. He continued acting for a little while after this, uh, but uh, sort of drifted away from the industry. I, I've always felt, again, every time I watch this, I'm, I'm struck by even more. Th these characters aren't cliches, are they? They could have written the older brother as, as a sort of a bullying figure yeah. of some sort but he's very very memorable and very sympathetic and and just as just as complex as as elliot i think and they all form these little bonds don't they yes. with, with with et 
it's it's really quite something to watch. Uh, Drew Barrymore, you mentioned Drew Barrymore there, is he? Most she's exactly. had oh easily she's had an yeah. incredible career she was just five years old when she made this believe it or yeah. not and uh, i mean i've always liked drew barrymore at the moment in 2020 she's heading up a uh, a self-titled chat show on one of the channels oh yeah in, in america yeah. apparently yeah. it's an absolute car crash bless her but what, <laughs> I, what i like about her what i like about her she throws herself into absolutely everything that she does and she and she can do it all and mm. please don't take offense drew if you are watching this but she can do this all <laughs> All of these things reasonably well, well enough. She's got immense star quality. So films, she does action in things like Charlie's Angels, yeah. comedy in The Wedding Singer. I love The Wedding Singer. Black comedy in Santa Clarita Diet, that thing on Netflix about the, yeah. the, the zombies, was it, or something like that? And uh, dramas like Riding in Cars with Boys. I thought that was a great movie. She was brilliant in that. There's a, there's a scene in the film that I really like is when they torture her doll to make mm. her not talk. Do you remember that scene yeah, when they grab a yeah. doll and they go, oh, like that? I can't, that, would, that reminds me of my family. We used to do that to our sister as well. <laughs> well they do. They behave like the average family, don't they, Izzy? Can yeah. you relate? Can you relate? To oh this yeah, setup? totally. Yeah, that, that it reminds me because I'm one of three as well. It reminds me of the same kind of dynamic that we had uh, when we were growing up. And I just think going back to uh, Drew Barrymore, she was just so charming and perfect for that role, and and despite only being what was it five years old she was so brilliant in her role in the like her emotional range as well at that age like she's just like steals the show she just absolutely blew me away she's amazing she, she is. is the audience's uh, biggest sort of rec recognizable figure i think she does and says the things that a lot of adults would let alone other kids things like that <laughs> It like, yeah. just makes me laugh just thinking of thinking about it. And yeah. here she was she was just six or seven years old herself. You know, it's incredible really what they managed to get get out of it. Like I say, I am gonna go and watch the special features on this, but I didn't want to dig mm. in I don't want to dig in too much until until I speak about them because you know you can you can get sort of bogged down in it. But yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful performance. And and Henry Thomas, I was I was a little younger than he was watching this, so I viewed him still as as an older brother character to me. Michael looked like a <laughs> thirty year old, you know. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Every, every time I see this, I'm always struck at how much younger everybody looks, and including Dee Wallace playing the mom. Now I I quite fancy her, but I wouldn't have ever done back then. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's funny. You, you work, you relate to all the different characters in different ways because I'm an elder brother too. So now, I, you know, in all seriousness, I can relate to to Michael. I you know, and it's Gertie. I, there's this scene as well. I thought this scene was beautiful we see oh, them point to uh, point to a book of, uh, of the uh, the continents and things like that and then they get a globe out and they say look this is where we are and et points in another direction doesn't he so i'm from out there somewhere as they as they bond but all that stuff around the home a lot a lot of this takes place in the family home doesn't it keith a hell of a lot of the the action the comedy the the pathos and and just the just the drama between them all yeah, yeah. Well, I, I remember I was a little bit like Ian in terms of um, I used to think that, you know, obviously the Americans always had bigger, nicer homes and, yeah. y y you know, it was all, lots of space and all that sort of stuff. But one of the things I did always relate to with the Elliot thing was a lot of the toys that he had decked around the, yeah. um, the place were Star Wars, you know, the, from the Empire yes. Strikes Back. They had star wars figures and and some of the vehicles and the play sets and all that sort of thing and uh you, you know again that made that character very relate uh, <laughs> because you know i, I he got the same toys, toys that you've well. got yeah exactly, yeah, yeah exactly. and they go through they go through them don't they as well ian they they name them this is hammerhead this is so and so yeah, and he, he plays do. with them and that's the, i don't think they do that now because obviously this was a universal film star wars was with fox yeah, I, I, because spielberg and george lucas they 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 were friends so yeah. um in fact uh george lucas when he saw the film the first time he didn't realize that they used et um in the yeah. uh, halloween Yoda. scene or, uh, Yoda, Yoda. Sorry, Yoda. The halloween scene and he was very he thought it was very funny was very he, he didn't stand up and say right spielberg i'm gonna sue you for using my property <laughs> <laughs> but he was very happy that they 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 did it so um, but i do i love i love the way he um because like i remember goonies came out and i hated the goonies because the kids 
to me, I couldn't relate to the kids. They keep shouting and they kept talking over one another. I couldn't understand what I was saying. But with the kids in ET, they seem so real to me when I when I was when I first saw it. They seem very very real. The things they did, like play Dungeons and Dragons and tortured their <laughs> the sister with the doll and stuff like that, and the bedroom <laughs> being a mess, like my bedroom was a mess as well, with loads of toys everywhere and stuff like that. So it I I did, and also my um dream of of living in such a place like suburbia. You know, because every Walt Disney Age film I ever saw, from Freaky Friday to Diamonds on Wheels, they were they were set in suburbia. So that was, you know, when you were a kid, you, you dreamt about living there, um, especially where, if you look outside my window, this is where I, I grew up. But, um, but yeah, it was kind of a dream to me and I could connect to it that way as a kid. So the house so looked, yeah. impossi looked impossibly big, didn't it? it seemed if, I, like if, I, if I tried to hide E.T. in my wardrobe, he'd suffocate. <laughs> 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 look, how, look how wide that wardrobe is. It's crazy. Like <laughs> the walking walk closet. Wardrobe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they stuff him in, in various different places, don't they? How about this one, Is it this picture of uh, E.T. playing dress up? Oh, I love it. It's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's when Elliot Brilliant. comes in and see and sees how uh, how Gertie has dressed him up. He goes, "Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> oh god, no, no!" Yeah. <laughs> what I noticed about it, and now, now you've mentioned it, the fact that it is a, a mess. There's there's clothes and bits of yeah. food and stuff all over the place. I think that that helps too. That helps ground it. And yeah. uh, I was at the time I was uh, very conscious of the Incredible Hulk, mainly because the TV show was on and it scared the life out of me when I was that age. Well, yeah, and that was the, there was lots, <laughs> lots of little things. So there's an Incredible Hulk poster there behind ET's head, mm. and numerous bits of the Incredible Hulk dotted dotted around. And I think that that with Star Wars in the cinema and the Hulk on television, those were probably the two for for under tens. That were yeah. the two yeah. two biggest things in media at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Two, two thumbs up there from Keith. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Speak and spell machine. Do you remember that? Well, I used that one of them. Speak and spell. Got all the all the toys, all the toys that we all had. We're talking yeah. about the, talking about the speak and spell. I mean the, uh, that that bit of kit. The fact that he uh, he puts together, <laughs> doesn't he? His yeah. his uh, gadgets to to call home. Call home. That's, the, that's the plot, isn't it? That ET's been left behind and and kicking around in suburbia for an extended period. You know, you watch a bit of trash TV, maybe read a couple of trashy magazines, muck about, and and uh, maybe a dip in the pool or whatever. Once you've done all that, holidays a holiday. He wants to go home, so go that's home. the idea. Yeah. Isn't it? Between them, yeah. they concoct a method, don't they? Whereby they can they can find out they can target ET's people, contact them again and say, Well, hey, come on, back here. You left you left one behind. It's, do you know what? The coach. It's, it's really uh, look, I don't know about you guys, right? But it's uh, you know, the way they portrayed the family in this, even things like watching Sesame Street. Because when yeah. I grew up, Sesame Street was on um one o'clock, two o'clock on TV. Um, I, obviously, we're talking way over Izzy's head because she grew up in a different time zone. Um, <laughs> but um, on, yeah, I think so. I'm not sure, but I, I, I love how clever it is because she he learns how to say "be good" through Sesame Street, and at the end, yeah. that's the last words he says to 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 Gertie, doesn't he? "Be good," and mm -hmm. the same thing with um, with with Elliot as well. The same thing. So I, it's a really clever, clever, clever script. Um, yeah. you, you can see any of this stuff, is he? But hey, such is life. And it's not. Sorry, No, no. I, I was going to say, and I always felt like, um, with regards to, like you said, the the the, if you want product placement in this yeah. with with all the stuff, um, it was funny because like sort of that that made a big impression on me as a kid, and then like sort of three years later, I found mm. Back to the Future very similar in terms yes. of there were all these brands and um, oh, yeah. you, you, you know bits and pieces that that, that that like Marty McFly's room was kind of a more grown up version of Elliot's room, yeah. and by then I'd grown <laughs> up a few years as well. So uh, I, I don't know. I just kind of always liked that with with posters and. You it's know, our, our world. Hey, if yeah. you want a pe if yeah. you want a Pepsi pal, you're going to have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know what? What is it? Um. Uh, so M and M's. They went to M and M's and they said, uh, "We're making this film called ET, and we want to use your product in the film." And uh, uh, the people that made M and M said, "No, 
screw off basically and then that's go to reese's pieces didn't they yeah and they use it because i always thought it was m m's when i was watching the film i thought it was skittles no it's, it's not right. skittles it's reese's no it's actually reese's pieces, but yeah yeah, yeah. and they um, and, i remember and then, the bag saying that but then i thought when he like dropped them down they was they looked like skittles but i don't know yeah, i, I agree like they do. to me but yeah. um but yeah i mean you know and then and then their sales went up didn't they well, yeah. this is piece of sales went up because of the because of, of the movie. So, well, this, so, yeah. this was a crazy one for merchandising. I mean, yeah. this, this was just. I mean, feel, yeah, it didn't feel like they planted all that stuff. It felt natural that's because cool, that's yeah. the kind of things that you would have in a, a kid's room at that moment exactly. in time. It was realistic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, certainly, Avian, certainly very similar. I can, I can, I can see them on the <laughs> on the shelf back there. Your. Uh, <laughs> RTD2 and <laughs> Sorry. I must apologize. I am a geek, of course. What can I, I think the, the stand the standouts, well, there's several standout scenes, several scenes and, and sites and still images that have yeah. become that word that none of us like to say, but sadly we we can't think of anything better. Iconic in inverted commas. Scene after scene after scene of in ET is iconic, isn't it? And I think obviously Steven Spielberg was and is the most skilled at his craft certainly that i that i can name in framing it, he knows most of those moments i would imagine even though you said this wasn't storyboarded ian that mm. astonishes me because yeah. i think most of his most of his most indelible marks on the pop culture landscape i i've no doubt they happened by design but with a, a, a spot of magic on the day inspiration on the day something that would have sort of stars he let, that would have yeah he, he let the kids um uh ad lib but also it's it's the small things that i love about this film like when elliot was pretending to be sick and and he, he has the thermometer and he puts it on the light <laughs> that's the kind of thing you did as a yeah. kid i mean right. well i did anyway <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I never. If I was clever enough to have thought of that, I would have done. Believe me. <laughs> I used to stick my head against the radiator so that when my mum would feel my temperature, she'd be like, "Oh, you're burning up. I need to stay on school, mum." Yeah. <laughs> guilty, guilty as charged. The <laughs> element. <laughs> so I, little things. Like, I notice little things like that every time I see this film. This has been the first time I've seen it in around fifteen or sixteen years. So it's a hell of a lot. But yeah. what I also noticed as well. Not only did the did the starting scene not confuse me this time. <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> the the elements that all that all that element about et's uh synergy with plant life and his bond with elliot as well which i never really understood that's why that scene with the frogs in the classroom all that stuff with nature kind of went past me by that environmentalist edge to this movie mm. and the uh, the connection that he forms with elliot i think and you know the film undoubtedly works on different levels because i just took it as it's a really sort of fundamental, basic friendship. The way that you do when you're that age, you've got a best friend, you know, yeah. boys or girls or boys and girls or whatever else. You've got a best friend and, and you know, you, you hold hands or whatever over the park. You get in or you get into scrapes when you're a little bit. <laughs> <Did> little... <you? laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, things like that. So you get you get into yeah, but you do, don't you? I mean, this this is it. So you do everything hand in hand, not literally, but 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 figuratively. I mean, sometimes literally at school. But you you know you do everything hand in hand with your best mate. You completely and utterly trust them in all things, and that that bond, I think, over an extended period of time, it's almost unspoken, and, and it's the same between Et and Elliot. And so as 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 the drama continues and E.T.'s attempts to contact her, and we don't know if it's been successful or not, do we? But E.T. risks risks his life and his, uh, spends a night, doesn't he, out, out in the woods and uh, gets yes. exposed to the elements and in intensive care for all intents and purposes. So when, when NASA comes come to the town, because they build that up as well, don't they, with NASA watching the house, they're, they're aware, they've tracked... The extraterrestrial to this one house uh, and the the timing of it is absolutely absolutely perfect just when et is uh, slipping away they mm. put him in intensive care but they also find that elliot's been unwell at the same time hasn't he yeah mm. it's that psychic connection and all, all that has completely passed me by and i, I found it? It really, yeah it, when i was a child it really ah. yeah completely passed me by i didn't i wasn't sure at all what was going on you know, but I, you know, obviously, you can tell when somebody's not very well, and that's all you really need to know when when you're like under ten. 
but, but also you know, it feels deeper, feels more spiritual. Uh, I, as a parent, I, I see something else in it too. As a, as a, as a, as a um, person watching it for the first time in the cinema, even I saw it on VHS, my heart still, my heart did kind of r rise when the bikes flew in the air, especially when they were flying. Yeah, because that's one of the things that you dream of flying, isn't it? Flying oh, yeah. was amazing to fly in the sky like that, you know, and 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 also, you know, um, the idea that they're running away from authority on their yeah. bikes, <laughs> on their bikes, you know, not in a car, but on their bikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, it, that, that seems pretty amazing in my opinion. Well, we all had BMXs back then, and I think even yeah. those of us who didn't have BMXs wanted one. And yeah. again, it was part of that thing you were just talking about, about it being impossibly glamorous, these sort of uh, big blue open skies, largely open roads, Nobody wagging their finger at you and plenty of people to go out and do this with. So, yeah, the, the scene in the forest in the middle where we first see E.T. levitate the bike to pass in front of the moon and create that iconic yeah, brilliant. that iconic image, which is now used on the Amblin logo, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah, it's right. more probably more recognisable to, to the younger generations. It's probably more recognisable or first recognisable from that, from seeing the Amblin sign than knowing where it's come from. But mm. yes, uh, there was this, the scene of the forest, and then this scene when they they're trying to escape. When when ET has recovered, Elliot has recovered, and they're trying to make their escape. I've just got that got that sort of banana box, bread box, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Supported supported obviously by an absolutely wonderful score by john williams oh, God, i mean yeah. oh, you, yeah. you know the part of the reason that flying sequence works so well is because of the music cue you know it's, it's, it's just so brilliant if you watch the, the the bike chase with with the sound down it really is very slow but when you watch it with the music it seems to move faster so that music had a really good impact on that scene um and also at the end in yeah, as I said, Keith knows more about it than me. Correct me if I'm wrong. John Williams couldn't get the points for the, the climax of the music. And he kept getting it wrong and he got really frustrated. And Spielberg said to him, do you know what? Just take the picture off the screen, do it, uh, uh, compose the music, how you think the point should come in and we'll cut around your music at the ending. And that's, that's what right. they did. That's why it's so powerful because the music is not is not a, a slave to what's on the screen. It's, oh, it's, it's purely yeah. natural. And then they edited the, the, the final shots to the music. So that's why, it, you know, that's why it looked great or felt great, whatever. But, um, because yeah. even, even though John Williams scores, I mean, he, he worked with Spielberg for years. At this point, he'd been, they'd been working together for years that day and with George Lucas. They continue to work together until the present day. I mean, I understand John Williams is pretty much in retirement now, but it's only been yeah. quite recent that he's gone into retirement. Their, their relationship continued very full scores mm. aren't they you know they, they sort of they seem to wrap all all around you and, and yet this it, it's just as evocative and just as adventurous but yeah. it's it's quite uh it's quite nuanced nuanced and quite restrained in places and mm. I mean, I keep using that word that word magical but it is it's almost like it's being sprinkled over the <laughs> film rather yeah. than rather than being sort of hammered being punched through and it takes a consummate, consummate uh, composer to get that balance right. I think that's the, some of the biggest composers working in working in music now. Could Hans Zimmer do something like this? For example? no, of course he couldn't. Th th this music is very magical, very very magical. But everything about this music is is fantastic. I mean, it's probably one of the best scores John Williams um, have has ever so. composed. I mean, Close Encounters comes pretty close, but this this, this 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 had this carried the emotion of the film the music music heightened all the emotion in my opinion of course yeah. obviously people disagree no. but. i mean uh, williams I, I don't think williams has ever done a bad score but this is this no. is certainly uh one of the um ones that's right up there but what, what what's quite interesting is is when you see spielberg interview when you consider that he's done films like Schindler's List and whatever since this, yeah. um, he actually still considers E.T. to be his most personal film, mm. which which I find quite, um, you, you know, I, if, if somebody said to me, what is Spielberg's most personal film? I'd have probably said Schindler's List, right? But mm. he actually considers E.T. to be probably his most personal film, which, um, yeah. which again, you can you can see the heart and love that went into it yeah 
absolutely. I think I think he was really he he kind of regretted um, putting all those new special effects in in the movie, didn't he? He kind of regretted it. That's well, why you, he went you, back to the original. Yeah, you can't get that version anymore. I mean, the irony is, like Dan earlier, for for a it. time, all you could actually get was the was what the um that version. But now it's the yeah. other way around. You can only get the, in fact that the 4K release that's come out only has mm. the um the original theatrical version, the yeah. the enhanced edition with the cape, like you can see there on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah is is uh is not available it's out of print unless you already have it which is How it's never been it's never been available in hd it's it's available no. on dvd but it's never been yeah. available in high yeah. def at all. how old were you when you saw it izzy when you saw the um film? i'm gonna say about seven or eight maybe i think for the first Perfect. time yeah <laughs> you never saw it in the Perfect. cinema no i didn't see it in the cinema oh you must I don't, think it's been, I don't think it's ever really been been back or certainly not since since the 80s maybe mm. part of a spielberg, spielberg no, the did. 2002 um yeah. anniversary edition oh, they was, was theatrical yeah, they did. for sure and yeah. they, oh, they brought it back in the cinema then yes yeah. they did More for the anniversary in fact a little a little bit of trivia um i don't know whether any of you go uh to like the um, uh and and watch um the Royal Albert Hall, I was trying to think of there, and yeah. watch it when they do films with live scores. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I believe that the re release of E.T. was the first film to ever do that, I think. And mm. now it's kind of a thing where you can go and watch movies, you know, with the uh, with an orchestra playing the, the score live with it. And they, they did that for this. I tell you what, though, seriously, um, Izzy, if you ever get the chance, and, and I know you're not as much as geek as, as as me and Keith and even Dan, even, but if you ever get the chance to go, if somebody says you come come to the what's that place called the the Royal Albert Hall, the Royal Albert Hall, where a composer like say for instance um, David Arnold or John Williams is, you should go because when you hear that music live, it's a completely different thing. I yeah, remember yeah. I went um, when um, David Arnold was was on. And he was doing all the Bond things. He was doing the Bond things that he did. When you hear the orchestra play that, you I, I was in heaven. I was like, this is amazing. Okay. I, literally hearing the trumpets, literally seeing him, because um, he doesn't really like um, or, or, uh, doing the orchestral thing, but he did it anyway for one of the Bond themes. It was, mm. I, I was blown away, totally blown away by yeah, the whole experience. So if you ever get the chance, you should go. Oh, I would definitely take it. If I get the chance, <laughs> I would definitely say yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, whatever. No, <laughs> I, 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 knew this. I can say the, these things, <laughs> they, they do sound absolutely incredible. And yeah. I, I can hardly imagine, like you say, the hair on the, on the back of your neck would yeah. stand, stand up immediately. Watching this film again for me now after such a such a big gap because this isn't a film that I've watched. This isn't like Star Wars for me, no, where I've seen it right. hundreds of times and I can recite the dialogue and I can you know I know all these silly facts about it. Nowhere near. It's a film that I loved. I loved ET at the time. That anticipation we were speaking of there. All those months I had to wait in between seeing my friend's badge <laughs> 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 and yeah. actually seeing the film. That was rewarded for me. I went to see E.T. with my grandparents at the local at the local cinema. My grandparents never went to the cinema. We all went as a family, my mother, my grandparents, myself and my little brother. So that was quite a rare thing in itself. That, so that's that was quite potent. Those memories have stayed with me. Yeah. And everybody liked it across all three of those generations, as you kind of like you're saying there. But after that, within a two-year period, I'd kind of forgotten all about E.T. Mm. You know... I Return of the Jedi came out, Back yes. to the Future came out, yes. Ghostbusters came out, and all these other things. Everything just gathered momentum. Cinema and movies. I got older. Yes, it, it all moved on. Spielberg yeah. moved on with uh, event, I mean, lots of films through the 80s. Yeah. More Indiana Jones. All that sort of thing that it just kept going. It just kept going. It just kept but going. Spiel, but Spielberg has a really nice story. He says that when they showed it in Cannes, because they were they were they were um, the the people at Cannes, they invited him to screen it, and okay. when they screened it. They, they, he had a standing ovation and they, they, they must have been clapping for about half an hour, some nonsense like that. And he said there was this one bit where when they were clapping, he got tired of the clapping. He looked down. I think he was above and he saw one light within the middle of the crowd lit. Somebody who's had, had their, um, their, their lighter lit. And it was Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis was, was, <laughs> was doing that. And Spielberg was like, 
That's Jerry Lewis. Yeah. He likes yeah. my film. And, 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 he, and he also received a telegram after that from Francois Truffaut yes, as well, course, saying, yeah. um, you're as much to cinema as, as me, or words yeah. to that effect, yeah. which... Uh, I mean, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. What, what struck me about, about it seeing it again this time is how, how magical it was, how clean the story is how well balanced all the all the characters are from from those from those kids there is either you mind you have if your family it <laughs> certainly reminds me of, of mine uh, and all all the stakes and the simplicity of that of that connection the mm -hmm. uh the hu the humanity in there and the the purity as well of uh, henry thomas his okay. performance is incredible for for a child of of ten or eleven. You know, I'm obviously whatever he's been through since I understand he's a musician now as well as an actor. He just does whatever, and I I do think it's good to see him doing nice stuff mm. and and clearly in a in a happy place because I view I view his performance in this film as very very special. It's amazing. I think the yeah. entire the entire thing is far better than I remembered it being, and you know, because I've just recently I bought the Blu-ray to watch again in on this occasion for to prepare for this podcast because i felt that was the best way to see it in, in its present <laughs> in its present form and i just i just soaked in it in a way that i don't think i ever ever have before i think it's absolutely mag magical uh, a standout classic and i I'll, I'll, i even say i think it's uh, spielberg's masterpiece as well it is that's it really is saying fantastic. that's really isn't saying it, something isn't it? Isn't it funny how the world's changed? You see these yeah. uh, photographs, behind the scene photographs, where Drew Barrymore sitting on Spielberg's lap, and you know, and he's hugging yeah, yeah, yeah. Henry Thomas. You could can't do that today. You, you know the, the the implications of today. It, it, this is how the world's changed from from then till now. Do you know what I mean? Uh, looking at kids and stuff like that. It's crazy, right? When you think about it. Absolutely and they all crazy. became stars, didn't they? They all became stars in the short they term. They did, yeah. For example, the Stranger Things kids recently have become pretty big stars, or yeah. certainly up until quite recently. And here we're looking at a shot now: Drew Barrymore with the then president of the United States of America, Ronald Reagan. And look mm -hmm. at that! Look at that smiles. Actually, both smiles. Yeah, they're <laughs> both very, very sweet. But that's how big they were, wasn't they? You know, that, huge. that's how huge. That's how huge it was. That, and when mm -hmm. I think, when I think back to uh, to the whole era of special effects, the dawn of Amblin. The yes. dawn of THX sound, all those innovations that were being done at the same time, but mostly by the same three, three or four people. Let's let's be honest. Yeah. They, were, they were constantly pushing boundaries. ET was a major stepping stone in all that as well, wasn't it, Keith? The uh, the the way the way through bringing bringing sight and sound and visual effects, taking them next level and bringing them all together to create this beautiful organic film that you can just sort of wrap yourself wrap yourself up in. <laughs> absolutely absolutely in fact somebody who um who does really deserves some mention in this is uh alan davio who was the uh, yeah. director of photography um he worked also on the color and empire of the sun with spielberg because mm. sadly he died during the yeah. covid lockdown this year yeah, so um mm. he died of covid related um problems health problems mm. and um i think he gets very overlooked because you know, uh, everybody always thinks of, you, you know, the other DOP Spielberg work with, whether it's Janus or uh, Dean Cundy or whoever, right? Mm. But, um, you, you know, the, the E.T. looks great. And uh, obviously the DOP is, 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 of course, involved in making it look great. So uh, well, I think... Making choices, making choices like this. That's my favourite exactly. scene. That's one of my favourite scenes where um, the mother was reading Peter Pan to uh, Gertie. Do you remember that scene? Yeah, I love Where, that. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're in the closet and they're listening to um, the mother read Peter Pan to Gertie. And I thought that's a very, very sweet scene, isn't it? And he cuts his finger on the on the thing and he heals his finger, <laughs> heals his finger and stuff like that. That's all very, uh, very clever and it's all very kind of sweet and stuff like that. But the movie works in so many different levels. Mm. It's, um, it's an incredible movie, let's face it. And it's a yeah. shame they don't think of movies like this anymore it's uh, they, they 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 see these things in a different light now so is he when you look at the et's face there and you can there's so much that he's emoting there that curiosity mm. 
animatronics back then because you know apparently et wasn't real so so these guys are <laughs> but what what strikes you when you when you look back at animatronics and special effects then and and characters like this does it mm. seem unreal to you how do you think it translates now in 2020 yeah so do you know what before i re-watched this i was thinking like what am i gonna think of et the character obviously he's like a quite a basic for now a days anyway animatronic yeah. um but it doesn't take away from his character. I still felt like the emotions, like watching him from him, um, I would still see him like looking sad and then I'd feel sad, you know. So it, like I said before, it just hasn't really dated. It's still got that like magical quality that even though it's old now, it still has it now, even today. So I think that's what's so amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I well think said. so. Well yeah. done. Yeah, well, no. well I'm so glad, Izzy, that you, um, you know, obviously we're here because this was your idea. And um, I'm just so glad that you came up with it because it, just to go back and rewatch this, um, you know, I've watched it many times over the years, but mm. to sit down again and sort of just rewatch it for this, it was just like, oh my God, this is, I mean, everything, it just makes me, yeah. Just take like, re re back. reliving some of your childhood, yeah, but still totally. with all the same magic. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, have, you, have you got a favorite scene, Izzy? Um, I don't know about a favorite scene. I think my favorite part overall of the whole film is just the uh chemistry between the children and ET. Like, even like if you watch the chemistry between um Gertie and like the older brother the way he's quite like um uh parental to her um mm. just I just love watching all the chemistry between them all and like we said even though E.T. was is now quite a basic animatronic you can still feel it and it seems still so realistic mm. so I think that's my favorite part in general of like like look at that that's just so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so that's my favorite part in general of it just seeing that whole like dynamic the chemistry between them I think it's so endearing mm. and lovely I just yeah I love it. About that, but yeah they do because obviously the 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 parents are separated aren't they and it's very clear mm. that there's been yeah. a vacuum a vacuum there where the father should be and they're all trying yeah. to fill it however they however they can they're, they're all handling it in completely different ways and as you say michael kind of kind of steps in with Gertie, doesn't he yes and, and, but i don't think she realizes that he's actually doing that and she's yeah. sort of um she's five going on 15. Yeah. <laughs> she's the engine that keeps it all going did you, do you remember the bit where they said um, like oh uh, who made breakfast this morning and saying oh i washed up and she went yeah, she yeah. Said, no, I, I set the table <laughs> he, he, I think the older one says i set the table and she says no i did and all this stuff. yeah um, it's, it's very much family stuff isn't it it's very yeah. much what you hear in your own family especially if you mm. come from a big yeah. family like me yeah, it is. It is very much. Yeah, it's very much. It's a great movie, and and, and it has dated a bit. But uh, it's it, as as Keith says. I watched it again, and even after watching the last scene, I literally stood there and watched the credits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? As it came, as it came, I watched everything to right till the end because yeah. I love the music. The music is. Mm at the end of the end credits is brilliant absolutely brilliant the, the the other thing that i love about this as well because it's kind of rare in the world now is, is the fact that it's a standalone film yeah you, you, yeah. you know um spielberg because this did do very well spielberg was actually approached to turn it into a franchise and to have uh, it talked about a sequel <laughs> and all this sort of thing and he said look you know if there was a good story to tell then yes mm. but this does it all we yeah. you know it comes it tells the story and there's no compelling reason that et would come back, back to yeah. the planet to see <laughs> elliot and all this sort of thing and i love that because there are very few films nowadays that exist just mm -hmm. as one piece of of, of art you know one yeah. one story yeah. and this is just one of those and great make no mistake this film is art you know what I mean? Oh, it's art and it's entertainment because if you look at the way it's directed, the way it's shot, and we talk about how you don't see the adults until halfway through the movie. We talk about the, the frog scene, which is absolutely brilliantly directed. You know, we talk about the shadows and the threat with no violence when the, when we get to the get to the scientists. 
We talk about how 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 natural the kids are. We talk about how it was shot, the bedroom, all those little clever things. It is absolutely, for me anyway, a masterpiece of filmmaking, you know, to me anyway. So agreed. Now agreed. Absolutely. Well, we've we've talked about it a couple of times. We've pointed at this, but we are going to mention now the special edition that apparently was brought out in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so the the general gist of it was that george lucas who was a friend of spielberg's as we've as we've said he had huge success remastering and re-releasing his original star wars trilogy in cinemas in 1997 hadn't he it was uh he'd reinstated lots of old footage that, that had previously been cut he'd remastered he'd re-edited and inserted this we get we get to the crucial stuff he'd inserted and substituted brand new updated special effects for key scenes and this this was really successful at the time mostly uh, and it inspired Spielberg to do the same with ET for that for that twentieth anniversary yeah. release. And uh, he'd he'd said a few times, and I'd heard him say in interviews that he'd been a little frustrated by some of the, some of the limitations of the animatronics mm. at the time, and felt okay now I can sort of scratch that itch a little bit. In the same way that George Lucas had with certain more quieter scenes in that original star wars movie but in this in this sort of special edition of et that did make it through to cinemas as keith's informed us yeah, shots of et spacecraft were heavily modified to include more lights and things like that some cut scenes were added a, a yes. di dialogue was altered for example mm -hmm. when the the michael is going to the fancy dress party and his mother says you know you can't go dressed like that you look like a terrorist uh, it's the, the word hippie is substituted. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So they get some dialogue that's different. But uh, most controversially, some of the elements were digitally replaced. Moved, yeah. Rifles in this scene, the big uh, uh, BMX bike escape, those rifles were replaced with walkie talkies in the, in the 2002 version. Mm. Walkie yeah. talkies, of course, then they weren't like mobile phones are now. And even the even the brick mobiles of the late 80s and early 90s, walkie talkies were huge. And the aerials were about two foot long, weren't they? They 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 um they put scenes that were unnecessary. They had the scene where E.T. was in the bath and he 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 goes yes. down. I don't, so this is the question, is he what what version did you watch? Was it the um, the updated version. Did you see E.T. E in the bath where he was I, like in the water? Did you see that? I bit? don't think so. I don't so remember. Oh, or maybe you didn't see uh, now, Yeah, because now I'm trying to think what did she um, call him when he was dressed up for Halloween? I think she might have actually said terrorist. No, in the, uh, in the version I saw. it wasn't that scene. It was the, the scene when you, the mother was saying something and you heard her say terrorist. Yeah, but as he was walking out. away, or oh, I, I'm not sure. No, um, I, I, it was when uh, Elliot she said was you're not. Gertie. Yeah, yeah. E Elliot, Elliot's talking to Gertie about the plan. You know, she's gonna, she's going as a cowgirl, but she's gonna, the and she's and all this. And you hear um, Mary in the background shout to um, Michael, "No, you, you are not going. You look like, like that. You look like a terrorist." And they yeah. changed, it, yeah, to hippie, and now it's changed back to terrorist because everything, yeah. So. Yes, everything's um, changed back, and that's why I was happy to trade off my DVD because I'd go. I'd only got the special edition on DVD, I and I didn't. Want, I didn't want to watch that version. It's actually over my shoulder there, next to my next to my cuddly ET there. You can see that. That's that's Enoch, my ET that I've had, my cuddly ET that I've had since 1982. That was made wow. by one of one of my mother's neighbours back in the day. I, oh, wow. uh, myself and my brother both had one made for us, handmade <laughs> that Christmas, believe it or not. And there he is. He's wow. looking slightly the worse for wear. I think he might have had a had a drop or two to drink last night, but he's still <laughs> still very much he's still very much with me. But uh, yes, a Spielberg. Yeah, well, of course we're now we're nearly twenty years on from the twentieth anniversary. Oh and my back God, in that's crazy. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tie, I'll tie Grandad because I've got a I've got a quote here. <laughs> I've got a quote here from Spielberg. A decade later, Spielberg would actually seem to agree with with you guys. He said, "There's going to be no more digital enhancements or digital additions to anything based on any film I direct." Yeah, that's good. He went on when people ask me which E.T. they should look at. I always tell them to look at the original 1982 E.T. If you notice, when we did put out E.T., we put out two E.T.s. We put out the digitally enhanced version with, with the additional scenes, uh, 
and for no extra money in the same package we put out the original 82 version but mm. i always tell people please go back to the 1982 version mm. Because there's a scene in it where he's running, running away from the scientists in the beginning. And in the original scene, it was um, it was it was it was taken as read that he was floating across to try and get away from the scientists. And then in the in the the the, the new version, they had a CGI of him running <laughs> like that, and it just looked a bit weird. I was like, oh, he's running now, is he? So um, that scene where he's making all the objects float around him when yeah. he's building the speak and spell machine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everything yeah, yeah. about it. The more I think about it, I'm actually going to, even though I've only just upgraded, Keith, even though I've only just got the Blu-ray, I'm going to have that UHD 4K. <laughs> I'm going to have that dropped into my basket for a oh. later date. Buy it through my link because if you buy it through my link, you help my channel and it doesn't cost you anything additional. So please buy it through my link. It's all in my Absolutely. show notes. Absolutely. <laughs> How much did that cost you, Keith? That one up there. Well, I was lucky. I got this for fifteen ninety nine. What? Oh, that's yeah. really good. But if you go on now, it's fifty quid. Yeah. So, so I was, I got, it, I got it, I got it, I got it, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a special, special offer. And I was like, oh, I'll, uh, I'm, I'm going to get you one of these, Izzy. Next yeah. time I see you. <laughs> Next time I see you, I'll get one of these. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amnesty time, everybody. We've all watched, watched this in the last couple of weeks. I want to know a simple yes or no will suffice. I will spare your blushes, but yes or no, did you cry? Uh, yes. Actually, I, I didn't. I teared up. You tear it up. I had teary uh, eyes. All right. I, 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 I don't, Did I you don't, cry? I blub. Mind me. I do every time. There's oh, something. Okay. About, well, <laughs> I, I, I kind of, I kind of cry a because obviously the story's very emotional mm. and very. Yeah. But also, I, I kind of cry a little bit because this is going to sound a bit sad. But back then when i realized that i wanted to be a filmmaker and all this you know and i was a kid i had it all ahead of me and it seemed like anything was possible or films like et you feel like mm. anything was possible and yeah. what's sad is realizing how how much time has passed you know and it's like uh, so i think i cry for two reasons <laughs> <laughs> beautifully beautifully put keith and yes i, I must admit i i did i did shed a, shed a tear or two for this and yeah I, partly because i think it is so it's so beautiful and it does speak to something deep inside the but yeah, are brilliant you think about the end. years years that have passed in between mm. yeah the performances are are brilliant yeah, fantastic Every, Everybody was swept away by this, Izzy. I, as I'm sure you've you've no doubt gotten already. But Izzy didn't cry. <laughs> I teared up. <laughs> that's, that's a, I just that's wasn't sobbing like Keith was. <laughs> uh, have any of you ever met anyone that doesn't like ET? Though that's what yes, I'm curious. Lots of, lots of I people. Have. Yeah, I have. Okay. Yeah, I have. Definitely. I think that the reason, and it's. I'll say this now, it's mostly males and yes. I and mostly males of a certain age. And why I think this is, I think it was people who loved close encounters, loved Raiders, and were just really knocked that the next film from the guy who made Raiders was yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's the exact opposite That's of the film they wanted from Steven Spielberg. Did and, you, and I, um, get, I get it. I saw, I do sort of get it. But at the time, I, I wasn't old enough to draw the dots yeah. to connect what a director did. So it never hit me like that. Um, did that's you, what it is. It's still you guys know on. about, you obviously know about Starman, right? So probably Izzy doesn't yeah. know about Starman. So basically, Spielberg went to Columbia Pictures and said, I want to make this film. But they turned him down because they had another film called Starman, which was... Uh, oh, uh, uh, an older woman falling in love with an alien that looked like Jeff Bridges, basically. So they thought that was going to be the big hit because no one's going to going to going to look at a film with a little kid and an alien, a love story between a little little boy and an alien. No one's going to like that. They're going to like this one. Yeah, How wrong it's, they were! Oh <laughs> man, is a great movie. Though, it's a good film. Like yeah, Carpenter yeah. and as I said, like Jeff Bridges and Karen Allen. So. Yeah. Uh, you know that that's yeah. that's a pretty awesome film as well, but obviously not as awesome as ET. <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, the Academy Awards, the Oscars. They agreed with you. It was nominated for nine Oscars at the fifty fifth Academy Awards, including Best Picture. But Gandhi won. Yeah, I know. Best I know but you know Award. what? Right, that's what put me off the Oscars because you know what? Um, ET is one in a million. You never get a film made like that again. 
and it's and it's so brilliantly directed. And Gandhi's a great movie, but Gandhi is a film like I don't know, like um, there's loads been, of other been, movies. Yeah, there's been several Gandhis before, and there's been several more since. I've got exactly. a quote. I've got a quote here from Richard Attenborough, who directed Gandhi. Yeah, at the Oscar. yeah. He said, "He said I was certain that not only would ET win, but that it should win. It was inventive, <laughs> powerful, and wonderful." I make more mundane movies. That's from the late Sir Richard Attenborough, of course. Uh, he went on to star in Spielberg's Jurassic Park. Sorry, yeah, I mean, on. that just goes to show how great Richard Attenborough was. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I always liked the fact that even though, you know, he won and in, in deservedly in many respects for Gandhi, but the it's fact that he recognised E.T., um, you, you know, you know I, I just kind of always liked that about Attenborough. And uh, and and yeah, absolutely. It was great to have him in uh, in yeah. Jurassic Park. Uh, you know, a yeah, decade, welcome to Jurassic Park, <laughs> which is which is another amazing Spielberg film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it, yeah. To be fair, though, uh, E.T. did win four Academy Awards: best original score, best oh, sound, the best sound effects, editing. All this for the sound. It chimes very much. Also, you were best there, crying yeah. from from Keith. Best, <laughs> best sob on screen and I best visual. Cry. And best visual effects, we love you for it, mate. Best visual effects, yes. Uh, these were awards, all very, very deserved. And uh, yes, it was a big hit with everybody, is it? As I'm sure you could imagine. But particularly this guy, he was really into it. Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, why did you I, go? <laughs> I don't, he is a little bit like that now. But yes, I don't know how this happened. Really, looking back. But Michael Jackson, for a time, really piggybacked E.T., didn't he? He became he synonymous with E.T. Yeah. E. And as we've really? just seen on screen, <laughs> yes, he narrated. He, <laughs> can you imagine anything worse than listening to this storybook of E.T. narrated by Michael Jackson? Michael Jackson. I did not even know this was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find it on eBay. I'll send you a link later on. Prices do vary. I, I won't lie to you. But yes, <laughs> look at that poster. Yeah, I'd forgotten all about this. He became fixated with ET because you know, Michael, Michael Jackson had. But had not only him, um, uh, Neil Diamond created a whole song. <laughs> Did he? Didn't he? Yeah, yeah, Heartlight. Okay. It's called Heartlight. Yeah. So Neil right. Diamond actually wrote a song that was devoted to ET. So <laughs> ET was huge, wow. okay. bigger than we, we all thought. You know, it was, it was in people's minds, it was people's hearts. It was. It was crazy when it came out. So even I said, even Neil Diamond <laughs> wrote wrote a song well, for the. I've for never ET. heard that, but I did own this. I own the soundtrack album on vinyl from back in the day. Uh, I did too. Little seven I got it here somewhere with the, with the somewhere rainbow on it. And, but what I didn't own was this picture disc on the How right. Cool is that? Ah, that's cool. Which is so cool. You, you would never want to play that ever in case you scratched it, would you? <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> yeah. picture of the moon there and the bike flying. That would look amazing in a frame. I yeah. did have lots and lots of ET collectibles at the time, colouring in books and things like that. You know, really sort of silly little things, cheap little things, but they were official merchandise and they meant the world to me. But I want to show you a couple of things as well as E.T. over my shoulder there. I've also got this. This is an E.T. key ring. Oh, E.T.'s, E.T.'s, uh, I was going to say E.T. M.G. He's got his E.T. soundtrack there. Oh, yeah, I've got my E.T. soundtrack. I'm, I'm going to have to get that. If it's on Spotify, Brilliant. I'm going to add it. But I wanted to show you guys my E.T. key ring, if I can get this close enough to the camera uh, on uh, YouTube. This is a set of images oh, there. I had that. Yes, I had that too. I had yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. Little yeah, illust I had it. It's one of those where you sort of yeah, 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 yeah. You, you sort of, of them, fan yeah. it up like that. Oh, these were quite widely bought. Then, oh, they? you've missed some days, Gizzy. You've missed some days. I know. <laughs> the magic, the magic here at my very fingertips. Oh, <laughs> That's there crazy. We are. Oh. I remember. Yeah. I lost it. Yeah. I lost it. And it's, I lost it's it. It was it. on my keys. I used to have it, it on a for the price of case. I oh, did you? I had an ET pencil, and I put that. On the zipper. Oh, God, you know? those days when you used to have pencil <laughs> cases. Oh, my it's God. Pencil, I, I remember those days. Oh, That's dear. crazly. I don't know oh, pencils. So don't they have oh, pencils so anymore, old. alone pencil cases. And no. Yes, something, else, something else I want to show you. Something else is about to pop up. It's these it's okay. now. Oh, yes. The yeah. Apple pencil. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I have got this here. This is this is an authentic. If I oh god, it's uh, I've actually got several of these, believe it or not. But this is ET's spacecraft there. Oh god! Oh. And it's got a little. Is you that wind, a wind up? You, that wind it up, up you wind it up at the side there, and when the when it counts down, ET 
himself. <laughs> oh, how brilliant is that? that is cool. How brilliant is that? That's crazy. That is cool. <laughs> Models uh, around there. It's sort of it, it's on wheels as well, so it sort of roams around if you let it. So that's that's a good one. That's I've got crazy. several other bits dotted, Have you got dotted any around. E toys, is he? I don't. I do <laughs> what a surprise! Not yet. <laughs> no. eBay is about to take a major, major <laughs> hit from his knee. Uh, but the other thing, the other thing I wanted wanted to briefly talk about as well, being a, a graphic designer and a little bit obsessed, John Alvin's iconic. I mean, all those iconic yes, images. We've seen the poster already yeah. of the bike and the moon, but this, the most famous poster, was painted by John Alvin, uh, the graphic of ET's hand. And the and Elliot's finger there meeting, and I wanted to show you these. These are the original, oh, original oh, sort of great. paintings. On the way to the final version, these were these were uh, earlier incarnations. So on the left, we've got a, a beautiful one there of uh, of the familiar two hands in so stars over it's the amazing. earth. Yeah, it's I think wonderful. it's just delightful. And then the second one, that what we're more used to seeing. But with mm. ET's actual fizzog looming over the back, I'm not sure why they why the one on the right was ruled out. It might have might have uh, viewed as spoiling the, the money shot. I don't know. Yeah. But it was I don't know. I still kind of kind of like that. It looks a bit like Planet of the Apes, maybe. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> but I think it's just wonderful. But I love that painting, and it's uh, I did have it a little version of it framed in my kitchen for a time. In the first, that was in the first house that I bought, it, and that was just there for years. In fact, it was up on my wall for so long it went a funny colour. But this, here is, and here's the final version there that everybody's yeah, so used brilliant. to. Mm. Just, just with the simple, just the symbol, sort of the simple star aligning at the at the fingertips there. Absolutely beautiful. Stuff. Reminds me of the cinema because that poster was because uh, in those days they used to have posters Ooh, on the cinema. Good. They used to paint. Mm. They used to have posters. That, now they've got it all digitally, haven't they? So I, that reminds right. me of painting the cinema. Yeah. What's that? You got ET What's there. This is this comes with that set. It's some of the Carlo Ramboldi. Um, oh, uh, cool. It, it oh. conceptual work conceptual uh that one, that one looks like izzy down the bottom there. Oh, <laughs> funny that's a terrible thing to say Keith. She knows we, have to work, we have to work with this girl you know <laughs> i love it we love it. We love it. Up, it. up to date ET is oh, still very much part oh, of the pop culture landscape oh. he's got his own pop vinyl Believe it or not, ah, Funko Pop. <laughs> yeah, looks a, a bit groot, a bit grootish, I would say there. But you can you can sort of tell it. CT, I I have a love hate relationship with pop vinyls. I think they're money for our rope for the most part. But hey, a lot of people like them. So one was really scared that that that, that the actual the way ET looked. He thought that people would be turned off by it because he wasn't exactly. <laughs> you know good looking he was a very ugly yeah. little creature but no, it, he was cute that's what i'm saying that's what a lot of people thought he was cute it, it, yeah. it's weird it's weird et because of because of his shape and anatomy though it's kind of um one of the few things that actually works well for a fun pop or a bobble yeah. head or something like that because of the dimensions it sort of works yeah. right because because spielberg always said that what he wanted was he didn't want it to be even possible to be a man in a suit. Yeah. You know, that's why he wanted the neck so thin and the head so large and all of that sort of thing with the design. And, um, but there's a, there's that story with Kath Kathleen Kennedy, um, was trying to persuade, um, Spielberg that they needed somebody in the suit when it was walking mm -hmm. around and Spielberg was trying to avoid it. And then she got some little kid, to put the suit on and they shot him and then they showed it spielberg and his film was like okay let's do that then. <laughs> but, they had, yeah. but they had um yeah. they had uh someone with no legs for the scene where yes. was, et was drunk and he falls over that's somebody that didn't have any legs that was in the costume yeah they were um, using like more, girl, people, you know. more people and amputees and whatever to kind yeah. of pull it off but yeah would it yeah. be would it, would it be in bad taste to make the legless joke uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. yes well i think this is this is the trick though isn't it Be, uh, em, employing yeah. employing people who can who can meet yeah. every need like that for every single scene in the mime artist to, to do the hands in a mime artist would be sitting underneath yes. ed and reaches reaches a hand up especially really? when he's at the table yeah and it was a mime artist that's hands that was was 
doing the thing and all that stuff. So because yeah, it's, it's never it's never treated mm. like a prop. Et is never treated like a prop in this. They they get a performance out of him, and I think that's why it's impossible to speak about it and not you, not say him because it is a character. He is a person. He does perform. Well, Izzy thinks so. <laughs> I do. E.T. E is uh, approaching its 40th anniversary, and as we yeah. all major hits, it spawned a lot of pay limitations, but I think generally it's... Mac and me. ...is, is uh, well, well preserved. <laughs> None of them came close, did they, Ian? None no. of that same no. magic. E.T. No. E lives on in the Amblin logo. Well, I'll tell, tell you what's real. really amazing about this film is when you watch the behind the scenes, and if you ever get the chance, Izzy, I don't know, I know you're not much of a geek like me and Keith and everybody else, but if you ever get the chance, watch the behind the scenes stuff. What fascinates me about behind the scenes stuff is that I keep thinking to myself, did they realize they would they were creating history here? You know, all they, they were just mm. walking around, you know, directing and stuff like that. But it was it was history, wasn't it? History in the making. When you look oh, at someone yeah. like it fascinates me how they couldn't see how big this thing was going to be. Not even Spielberg could see. He just thought it was going to be a little movie. People are going to like it. And then that's the end of that. But it was <laughs> huge, you know? And then when you look at it, you think, my God, I'm, I'm looking at history here. It's like, mm. it's like when you look at a video shot on VHS when you were 10 and you look at yourself <laughs> and you think, oh my God, that's when I watched the behind the scenes of E.T., that's exactly what I think. I think, my God, look at Spielberg, how young he was. Look at those kids having such <laughs> yeah. a great time, you know? And look at that, the equipment, which I want. Give me that camera, you know, and stuff <laughs> like that, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. But yeah, no, crazy, right? E.T. E. did remain the highest grossing film of all time for an incredible 11 years, everybody. As we spoke about those other films that came out in the 80s and that did have that same impact that you just described, Ian, that were the biggest thing ever. Everything yeah. was the biggest thing ever, but nothing eclipsed E.T. until 1993. Steven Spielberg again with Jurassic Park. E.T. Yeah. E. is still shown regularly and re released over and over again on all these various formats, which our friend Keith is going to... He's going to fill you in. He's going to keep you <laughs> fluid up on all of those. That's if you right. head over to Home Media Mindfield, going to tell us some more about that in a moment. But the question I've got for the three of you is simple. In this sophisticated age with, with dozens of fantastical, modern family fantasy movies available at the push of a button on Disney Plus and all the rest of it, does E.T. still speak to the child in all of us? Should the curious, whether they've seen it before or not, should they look again, add to their list uh, and spend two hours with this film watching again? What, what do you think, Keith? Oh, I mean, absolutely. It's it's uh, it's a timeless, universal film. And uh, I, I think if it's worth two hours of anyone's time. And if somebody can't see the good in this or be moved or be taken on the journey, then, you know, I feel sorry for them. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. but yeah I do agree. it Ian yeah. what's really no, your final that, that, uh, there's no question there's no question I mean the thing is that people have to be patient now when they watch the film it is two hours and and um mm. young kids they don't mm. have the the attention span as as we did when we were kids so yeah if you're going to watch it watch it from start to finish don't take any breaks and then you'll be immersed into the film I guarantee you would like it if you haven't seen it yeah, that's so, my take that's anyway guaranteed to stop you from looking at your phone is it? Yes. This was all your idea. So How do you feel? We've been there, we've watched it, we've done it, and you've been there and had made first contact with this bunch of aliens. Was, <laughs> this, <laughs> was the experience worth it? Did you enjoy looking at the film again? And does it stand up? Oh, in yeah. The way that you believed? Yeah, for sure. And um, like you were saying, because now at the push of a button, we have all these like high tech, fancy movies and whatnot. And I think anyone can appreciate like the beautiful like simplicity of this and like the characters are timeless like like I was saying earlier the chemistry between everyone is timeless and I think everyone can relate on some level to that movie it's just a mm. classic it's just brilliant everyone should watch it definitely absolutely there you go it's been great <laughs> to catch up with E.T. <laughs> and to spend this last hour and a half-ish with the three of you but that is it for now Anything, yes, you can reach out to any of us. Anything you want to ask us directly, maybe we've got it right. I think we have got it right this time. Could be you think we've got it all wrong. Are you one of those people out there who still still holds a grudge against DT e. for not being in the next Indiana Jones movie, for example? <laughs> Let us know in the comments what? section. And while exactly. you're there, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and stay subscribe. tuned for more listed 
great. Maybe old stuff like this, maybe slightly newer stuff. Maybe we'll look, <laughs> look at the future. I'm not entirely sure. You can, yeah, leave us leave us a comment, like, subscribe, share. Email us at the spacebook at outlook.com. Contact us <laughs> Twitter like. and Instagram at the spacebook. <laughs> There's our Facebook page and the spacebook's own Facebook group for real time talk of all out there entertainment, past and present. I can be found on Twitter and Instagram. Dan Hadley at the Spacebook, where I talk about anything geeky that may catch my eye, imagination or both in popular culture. Come and find me there. Izzy, where can people find you, for, see your work, <laughs> make um, contact, contact? The best place to find me would be on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is Isabel underscore Allen. There we are. And <laughs> Keith. <laughs> and, <I'm> <laughs> And Keith, tell us, tell us, then we've got a few plugs in already, but tell us about Home Medium Minefield, my friend. What's coming up over there and where can you sort them out with ET goodness? Yeah, um, well, uh, Home Media Minefield, we look at physical media releases, uh, 4K, Blu-ray, DVD, etc. Um, both old and new films, it, it sort of varies. Um, ET is coming, this version, and I look at the different is talk about the picture the audio and the special feature and the different versions that are available etc so that's home media minefield on youtube and on instagram uh and i also have uh, british isles as in my name there e-y-l-e-s um i've got some short films that i've written produced directed and all that sort of stuff there so please check that out as well yeah never mind never mind phoning and going home he could be coming home going with home. you if you place an amazon order <laughs> or whatever else ian where do you want where do you want me to point people towards where, where uh, can people find and hear more of your wonderful work my channel uh, rebecca gold's got a, a web series rebecca gold everybody knows it's five episodes keeps in it by the way but don't let that put you off <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've also got a feature film on there that I shot 10 years ago, which Keith is in <laughs> as well. As well yeah. Don't let that put you off. <laughs> Called Bad Day. And it's a, it's a good movie. Um, it's a bit violent. <laughs> it has some stars in it. It has Claire Goose. It has Donna Eyre. It has um, loads of stars Sarah in it. Sarah so, from Girl Yeah, Black. Sarah Harding. Yeah, Sarah Harding. Yeah. She's in it. So if you, if you fancy watching a movie, no. then watch Bad Star. Day is all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> I can't really go far wrong. Yes, I've really enjoyed this one, everybody. I Sincerely, it, it's been a revelation to me, a film that I've seen so many times to call it a revelation. Seems absolutely mad, but it really, really was. So, yes, thank you to all of you, and thanks to you for watching. Join us again next time here on the Spacebook channel for more of the Spacebook listed, all those all-time old, old greats. But, yeah, go and watch E.T., The Extraterrestrial. We loved it. You probably will too. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> He's still laughing. I